Hello everyone, this is Jason and welcome back to the channel. Today, I'm honored to have on the show George Pendle, the author of Strange Angel, The Otherworldly Life of Rocket Scientist John Wyside Parsons, which is the basis for the CBS All Access show Strange Angel. Season 1 and 2 are available. Season 2's season finale is tonight. It is July 25th, 2019. So I want to, in advance, thank George for taking the time to speak with me, and I hope you enjoy the show. Thank you. All right, everyone, um, I'm so happy to have uh, George Pendle uh, with me today. He's the author of the book Strange Angel, which is the basis for the CBS All Access show Strange Angel, published as Strange Angel, The Otherworldly Life of Rocket Scientist John Wyside Parsons. George, thank you for joining me today. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. So, when you first began writing the the book, were you aware mm -hmm. of um, Jack Parsons, um, Aleister Crowley, and the uh, uh, Thelema religion when you first started, or is that something that you found out um, over time? No, I, I really wasn't familiar with any of it. I mean, I had a you know, a slight knowledge of Alistair Crowley just because he is, um, you know, such a kind of, uh, a, a kind of countercultural hero. Uh, um, you know, he's on the cover of Sergeant Pepper, so I knew that. And I, I knew that he was known as the wickedest man in the world. But that was really it. He was really nothing more than a kind of, you know, uh, a kind of symbol for, you know, uh, the occultist in the 20th century. Kind of. Um, but as for Jack Parsons, I didn't know anything about him, and I didn't know anything about uh, Salima either. Um, really, I got into it by uh, through journalism. I'm a journalist by trade, and I was writing a, a, a piece on uh, Kenneth Anger, who's an experimental filmmaker. Right. Um, I was commissioned to, to do this by, by my editor. And I was looking into Kenneth Anger, and it turned out that Kenneth Anger, in one of his films, uh, I had this woman called Cameron who yeah. appeared in one of his uh, 50s films, a, a film called Inauguration of the Pleasure Dome. Right, yeah. And, yeah. yeah, and so so I kind of, you know, I was looking into it and I saw, read in some uh, book of avant-garde film, it was just like a little footnote saying Cameron was married to the, occult, the occultist rocket scientist uh, Jack Parsons. And that was kind of it. <laughs> and I was like, wait, there, there's got to be more to it than that. Um, and so I started looking, and, and I looked around. I, I looked in um, Mike Davis's great uh, history of, uh, of L.A., which is called City of Courts, and there was a bit more about Jack Parsons and a little bit about L. Ron Hubbard at the same time. Right. Um, and then I was looking around. It was really kind of scratching all this stuff from the corners, and eventually, it wasn't for some time. It was about six months in that I found uh, this book, Sex and Rockets, which had been written about Jack Parsons back in the 90s. Um, and it was, you know, it was good in that it had more about Jack Parsons than I'd ever seen anywhere else. Right. But it was also kind of freighted with a lot of uh, hearsay and a lot of rumor, and I didn't think it was written particularly well. Um, and at the end of it, I didn't really get an idea of who Jack Parsons was. And so my idea was to kind of, using a journalistic approach, kind of cut through all this ticket of rumor and hearsay and, and kind of all this kind of unknown story of Jack Parsons and trying to figure out what actually happened. Sorry. Um, that? No, that's a great point because um, the group that, that I'm in, um, there's a Facebook group dedicated to the show. And one of the, um, one of the um, questions was your book, Strange Angel versus Sex and Rockets. And, mm -hmm. you know, your, your book was a basis for the show. But what a lot of members of the group pointed out was the show tended towards the sensational. So it was a wonder of did they did they try to blend the two books together in order to make something that was sellable? You know, like uh, um, they could because if you if you read if you watched any of the um, interviews, the main point that people talked about was the sex and magic. Right. Right. And they made it and it, it the billboards, you know, big letters, you know, sex, magic yeah. and rocket science. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. So and but what I liked about your book is that your book actually 
came across as this is Jack Parsons, not this is Jack Parsons, but look, we're about to have an orgy, you know. It, it, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, basically, I, 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 I know what you're saying. I mean, you know, in my book, there's still plenty of sex magic. I mean, that's something that's undeniable that Jack Parsons took part in. Um, but no, what I was trying to do was write a non-fiction account um, and basically have proof for everything. Right. So basically, every little fact that appears in my book, of which there are many, is either, you know, has it has some uh, interview or it has an oral history or it has, uh, you know, a document that uh, refers to it, you know, which the Six and the Rockets really didn't. I thought it, you know, it was fine and it allowed the author to kind of hypothesize a lot, but uh, I wanted to really bring it back down to reality. And the thing is, bringing Jack Parsons' story back to reality doesn't make it any less strange. True. It's equally weird if you're, if you're using, you know, if you're basing everything on what happened. True. So, so that was really it. I mean, as for the TV show being more sensational, I mean, there's, there's no doubt it is. I mean, it's it's not, you know, a biography like my book was. I, I, I very much, you know, wanted my book to be watertight when it came to what happened. You know, I, I would say what I knew, what I didn't know, I also said. Right. Um, and I think because TV shows, you know, dramas in particular demand a kind of, they demand, you know, actual stuff happening. They demand a kind of a through thread of, uh, of a narrative. Then they've kind of pieced together various hypotheses. I, some may, I don't know if they've read Sex and Rockets or not, but, um, but definitely some of the hypotheses that come out of uh, Jack Parsons' story uh, appear in, in the TV show, I think so. I mean, I, I don't particularly begrudge them that. I, I know they're making a, a drama and it's it's something different to the book um and you know a lot of what they do i think a lot of what they, they hypothesize like the actual life of jack parsons in his uh you know in his house uh, amidst the cult i think I, I have a feeling it must be true there are certain aspects of it which ring so true and seem so realistic um, the so the 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 tv show as opposed to the book seems like it's merging people um into composites um yeah. for example yeah. uh richard onstead who is working with jack in the tv show is pr- more than likely frank molina um in who, right. who is his real life partner um and the um professor who is uh what's his name Muslim um in the tv show yeah. Um, I forget the name of his real professor, the one that brought them into Caltech. Um, that would have been Von Karman. Von Karman, yes. Von Karman, yeah. Theodore Von Karman, um, yes. Um, and so they looks like they're they were hodgepodging people together, which was kind of off putting at first because my idea was, well, why would you need to do that? You know, I can see them right, doing yeah. that with someone like L. Ron Hubbard because there's additional baggage that goes along with that name. But, you know, why didn't you call Helen Parsons Helen Parsons, right? Right, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, I can't really answer, you know, I, I can't really answer for the filmmakers. I, I've really not been involved in the TV process uh, very much at all. This most recent season, they sent me a few scripts in advance to kind of, you know, take a look at, but I, I'm not really involved in any of the writing for it. Um, oh, okay. But I would imagine that, that, that the composite, I mean, like you say, the Richard Onsted character, he's a bit Frank Molina, he's a bit Ed Foreman. Right. Um, and I think the idea is just to kind of streamline it so that you can combine these two storylines into one and you can merge you off. I mean, uh, funnily enough, you mentioned L. Ron Hubbard and, and he would be more likely to be a composite. composite. But um, I think I'll find later in the season that actually he's one of the characters who is not <laughs> a composite. Um, so he will be referred to, I think you might find later on, um, very much by name. Oh, okay. um, but but I think I think it's it's kind of, you know, I'm not a, a screenwriter myself by trade, but I can kind of see why they did it. It's a way of kind of, if you're going to attach a narrative to somebody's life, which, you know, you can say Jack Parsons did this and that and this and the other, but it's very hard to attach that to a five season, you know, 10 episode um, per season kind of show. Uh, and I think by having a composite, it allows you a bit more variety. You can choose different aspects of a person's personality. I mean, I, I was a bit off-put as well when I first saw it, but now I kind of see that 
it actually helps foreground Jack's character in a way. Um, and I think that's the main thing. You, you kind of want the spirit of Jack Parsons. Right. Um, and if, if some of the other characters, I know it's a shame that Frank Molina isn't there by name, but I think it'll allow uh, Jack Parsons' character to kind of come through all the more clear. I don't know if that makes any sense. But, no, no, it does. It does. <laughs> that's, that's my best bet. Well, I mean, what the character of, of uh, Ernest was basically the gateway mm. for Jack to discover Thelema. You know, in the in yeah. the show, where there yeah. isn't, I mean, there there are people he he's met in his life that you know were that gateway, but for the sake of a narrative, it's easier if it's just one person. Yeah, and I think in a way, the Ernest character, I I, I know that I've, it's had some blowback from people you know who who helped me write the book. Um, but in a way, it's a way of externalizing Jack Parsons' internal character to a certain extent. Right. I mean, he, he seems like Jack's id made flesh. Right. Know? He's like in opposition to, and yet part of Jack. Right. And exactly. so, so I think what they've done is actually quite a, a subtle, uh, uh, you know, uh, thing. And it's actually kind of, they've separated Jack's character and put a certain, that kind of drive for belonging and and for the occult and everything they kind of put it into Ernest's character so it's a kind of dual character there on screen um and to some extent as we're seeing this season it's kind of foreshadowing of jack's own future i mean this is this is totally my own kind of theory on it well no I, I, yeah I, I, I was confused by it as well but you know, the, the screenwriter is this guy mark Heyman, who's a, a very smart guy and he's written you know a couple of very smart you know movies um one being uh, what was it, Black Swan? Is that right? Oh. Um, but uh, but uh, he's um, he's very good at kind of just at the kind of psychosis of personality, and I think that that's what he's done with Ernest here, and he's really kind of made a psychosis flesh. Um, so that's that's the way I see Ernest's character. He uh, he is the kind of gateway character in in Jack Boston's real life. He was introduced to the OTO by, you know, a couple of friends of friends, and, and they really played no further part in his life, as far as I can find out. Um, but I think by having Ernest as his gateway, he becomes not just a gateway to the OTO, but he becomes a reflection of Jack's own yearning for the OTO. Right. And then also, as we... As, uh, spoiler alert, guys, it doesn't uh, end well for Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Um, right. Yeah. It, it, it's. I, I, I mean, don't think I don't think they're changing that. Right. And I'm, well, I mean, and you know, I'm I'm really hoping the show comes back because there's so much more to explore. Like you mentioned, Cameron, and she herself is a, a very very interesting person. I mean, is worthy of her own TV show, quite frankly. Um, mm-hmm. But the 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 way that Ernest left out of the series is what I would expect the way that they'll have Jack shown out of the series too because of the explosion that killed him. Um, mm, yes. Now the the question that I, I wanted to ask you um, was there's there's still the mystery of what happened. And so you have uh, an explosion, I believe it was 1952, and he he dies in an explosion. Um, he was he is said to have been doing a uh, last minute uh, job for a studio, um, an explosives mm-hmm. uh, job. But there's also the whole thing about the gangster that he testified against in the 1930s that mm-hmm. may or may not have come back for revenge. I mean, where where right. do you where do you fall on that? Do you think it was an accident? Well, it's, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, yeah, you have all this hearsay, which is kind of, you know, the lingering uh, kind of character of Jack Parsons. All that existed was this kind of rumors of his death, um, really, when I was started writing it. And so there was this idea that he had testified against this corrupt cop who was had done all these car bombings in L.A., had the corrupt cop you know, killed him. There was even talk of Howard Hughes. Jack Parsons had worked for some time with Howard Hughes and, and had Howard Hughes killed him for stealing confidential papers. Or, okay. um, or was it just an accident while he was making this? Or was it some magical ritual gone wrong? But those were the four kind of main theories that came about. 
Uh, I kind of ascribe to, to the Occ- Occam's razor approach, which is like the simplest answer is usually the right one. Yeah. Um, and so I kind of thought that, you know, he had been known to, to sweat a lot. He had been known to take amphetamines, which could make you a little jumpy. He was rushing to get an order done on, for these, you know, special effects he was making at the end of his life. Such a kind of, you know, a, a descent from his great rockets to, to these special effects. But he was rushing to get these done. He had packed up all his... You know, proper scientific equipment and something gone wrong. I kind of des- did describe to that. But then funnily enough, when I was offering some tips to, to the, you know, about the screen, about the screenplays, which I was saying about the TV show, uh, you'll notice in the TV show that there's a lot more drug use than uh, I had possibly written in the book. Yeah. I, I had, you know, there were, there were rumors that there were rumors that were, there, there was drug use that Jack had been using some. Jack had been using drugs, but I never got an actual person saying he did coke, he did, you know, this or that. You know, uh, a lot of people at the time were using amphetamines. I think that's fair enough. Right. But then I was thinking, you know, they they show him um, taking heroin, and it's interesting because I do have uh, in my book a, a quote from one of the people who was living in Jack's coach house when he died, saying that they cleared up loads of needles from uh, a wastebasket after the explosion that killed him. Mm. And and I originally thought that those needles might have been used in his uh, in his experiments, you know, like pipettes, kind of dropping in right. tiny little you know, bits of explosives. But then I was thinking, I was looking into it, and I suddenly was looking through my notes again, and I realised that actually creating heroin, which you know was always rumoured, but I never had any proof, but it's actually quite dangerous, and uh, as part of the process. Uh, if you're slightly careless, you know, you create this kind of volatile ether gas, which can ignite and produce a violent explosion. Um, and this often happens in kind of like, you know, undercover heroin labs. Um, but I suddenly thought, oh my God, it's been 15 years and this other theory has come through. Maybe he was making heroin. Mm. Maybe by that point in his life, he was making heroin and it went wrong. Um, so... So rather than like having the 15 years since the book has been written, rather than actually really finding out or, or thinking I know what happened, I think it's only got more complicated. I now think I want to add this extra theory to, to the possibilities that killed him. That he was maybe kind of making his own heroin and he died in an explosion. Um, so I'm yeah. not entirely sure. Well, if, I, if I had the bet on it, I'd probably say it was an accident, but... No one can know except for Jack himself. Right. Well, I mean, but we we hear about um, drug labs exploding all the time, so that's not right, that's right. not that out of the question, really. Especially when you consider it's not like no, he no. had state of the art technology at his disposal that we have today. No, exactly, and and this is this is an exclusive to your podcast. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I I do think it's actually you know when you look at. Uh, you know, the chemistry uh, required to build this. You know, one of the ways of using, uh, of making, uh, sorry, of, of uh, changing morphine into heroin, you use uh, acetic anhydride, which is a chemical which was used by the Germans in World War II as a component for, wait for it, rocket fuel. Oh boy. So one of the very chemicals used in rocket fuel is often used in the making of heroin. And it just seems like you know, he was down on his luck in 1952. He had fallen from a great height. He had, you know, he had lost everything in his professional world. You know, his private world was a complete mess. Um, who knows if he was taking heroin? Um, it seems definitely he had taken it at some point. Um, but maybe, maybe that's that's what happened. Maybe he was making it and, and blew up for making it. Well. That goes well. You bring up a good point about the where he was at the end of his life because, you know, at one point he would have been considered what we consider today a, a millionaire, based on his work with uh, JPL, the military, and uh, Aerojet. Um, do you think the what ended up as I guess a catalyst for his downfall was? Uh, Helen um, leaving, or do you think it had more to do with the issue with her sister and L. Ron Hubbard making off with his money? You know, yeah, well, I think both of those uh, had, had a big effect on him. I, I think it was like this, you know, as you'll 
see in the TV show. And if you read my book, you can see it. It was like this accumulation of bad luck and bad decisions, which kind of snowballed and overtook his life. I mean, you start with the fact that, you know, he was thrown out of Aerojet and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I mean, he wasn't thrown out. He was bought out. But he was really kind of squeezed out of the boat because he was no longer seen as necessary. You know, he had made rocket science, you know, palpable. He had made it real. Um, but from that point on, other scientists could take over. And okay. he wasn't the sort of guy who, like, could just slip into a white lab coat and, you know, and, and spend all day over the Bunsen burner. He liked to experiment. He liked to blow things up. Um, so you, have, you, you take away this professional side of him. And then he leans so heavily into his occult side that I think he puts too much weight on it. Yeah. And then when that falls through, he's left with nothing. There's no platform left. And he's left hovering in the void. Okay. Um, you know, you add L. Ron Hubbard coming along at the worst possible time, stealing his girlfriend, taking his money. <laughs> you, you have uh, the FBI involvement, you know, uh, basically tracking down all the members of, of the early Jet Propulsion Laboratory and, you know, systematically kind of getting rid of them one by one. And, you know, Parsons was swept up in this and, uh, as well, this scientific blacklist. Um, and you add all these together, you know, the lack of a professional basis, the overwhelming desire to make something work in the occult and it not happening, the loss of his love, uh, the unstable political climate. And I, it's like a perfect storm right. for kind of the disintegration of a personality. Well, you also have the, it being that it was post-World War II and we were turning our attention to communists. And so he mm. had you know, f- uh, friends who were, who may have been affiliated with the Communist Party in the 30s and the 40s. And then, of course, once that all started, they got ran out of um, government work and put on, like you said, blacklist and things like that. So it was just like a perfect storm of events, really. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, he, you know, uh, d- yes, you know, Frank Molina and uh, various other members of what they call the Suicide Squad, the early members of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, you know, were members of the, of the Communist Party back in the 30s. But this was a time when, like, when Russia was an ally, when right. communism was just seen as, like, you know, a progressive political cause. Uh, it wasn't the great enemy it was after the war. So a lot of these people, you know, really did kind of get swept up not really because they were spies or even as if they were sympathetic to the communists after the Second World War. It's just from this pre-war kind of affectation for, for, for kind of progressive causes. Um, so it was really bad luck in a lot of cases. I mean, I think, was, of course, there were Soviet spies in America working in the scientific establishment at the time. So the FBI wasn't completely wrong. Right. But I think it was a big net which swept up a lot of innocent people in, in, in it. Well, it's similar to the Hollywood... Um, the, when they were bringing actors in for uh, suspect, suspected ties with communism and things like that. Um, yeah. Or that yeah, was going on at the same time. Um, it was not, not a good time, you know. No. It, well, I mean, any time that you suspect, and I mean, what one thing that I like about the show and and your book is that you can see the parallels with today that that people have experienced even back then where, you know, you don't know when someone's going to knock on your door and try to question you about whatever, you know, based on whatever the current scare is, you know. It's very true. No, it's, it's very true. I mean, there is a there, there is a great, you know, you know, I don't know if moral is the right word, but there's a great warning in Jack Parsons' story, which is that you don't, you know, there are people who can help you move forward as a country, as a nation, as a science, or whatever, who aren't necessarily, you know, the people who you would think they would be. They're not like the people uh, in white coats. They're not, you know, all, they don't fit into pigeonholes. Okay. Um, and sometimes you need these people who don't fit into pigeonholes to help you move forward, to, like, uh, create new things. You know, you don't get out of your pigeonhole unless you have one of these other people, you know, running around outside thinking crazy ideas. Right. Um, yeah, and so it's really, you know, if there's, if there's any inspiration, which I hope, you know, can be found in possible stories, but you know, you need to nurture these people who are who are outside, um, right. just so they can broaden the vision for all of us. Well, you need your you need your outliers. I mean, you need your the right. like the the closest person for me that we have today that mirrors Jack is probably Elon Musk. 
where that's true. Although, he, he's a bit he's a bit kooky, <laughs> uh-huh. you know. But he's a little more successful too. I think. Right. Uh, well, I mean, you know, you know uh, he he. Uh, but he 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 doesn't let people tell him what he can't do, right? And right. his goal is to get us to Mars, which I think would, if Jack had have been able to stay in the the industry, probably would have been his next goal. Is okay, we got to the moon because he he was a fairly young man when he died, you know. Uh, yeah, he was thirty seven. He was thirty seven, right? 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 So, which is nothing. It does, and he'd done all of his scientific work, you know, before the age of thirty. Uh, I mean, all his all his great breakthroughs. Right. Um, so, no, I think you're right. I mean, there is a certain kind of Musk-like quality to uh, to, to to Jack Parsons, um, or Parsons-like quality to Elon Musk, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I I think the problem was it was just he was what Elon Musk is doing is basically reinventing the car, you know, and he's also, you know, working with, with rockets and trying to push it further. But what Parsons did, I think, was he kind of invented the whole science of rocketry. Correct. There was no courses before teaching rocketry. There were no, you know, scientists specializing in it. Right. He was starting from scratch. And in a way, uh, it feels like, you know, I know that, that that was a bigger step, it seems. I mean, I'm not in any way tantalizing what Elon Musk is doing or wanting to do, but I'm saying that kind of Parsons had to make a bigger step, and in a way, uh, it was, he was easier to get rid of once he'd made that step. Right. Um, once he once he laid the groundwork, they didn't need him anymore. And you know, right, it's exactly. it's um, one of the things that fascinated me about his story is that he taught himself rocketry. Mm. You know, he wasn't, uh, uh, I mean, you couldn't go to school for that back when he was doing it, you know, he had to, he had to figure it out himself, um, him, Ed Foreman and, uh, Frank Molina had to basically, does, they had to create a science. That's right. I mean, they did have one great guy's guide to their work, which was science fiction. Right, and that shouldn't be downplayed. I mean, the only people who were talking about rocketry, and sometimes at great length, were the science fiction writers. You know, you think of H.G. Wells, Jules Verne, but also all the pulp writers from the nineteen twenties and thirties. Um, people like Jack Williamson, or you know, Robert Heinlein, or even L. Ron Hubbard. You know, these were people who were seriously thinking about how could you make a rocket. A lot of them had scientific degrees, mm. um, so. So they, that was the kind of Bible that Parsons worked from. But you're right. I mean, you use those to kind of create the science from scratch. Um, I mean, people thought rockets were delusional at the time. Right. Well, but I mean, you think that um, along those lines, science fiction gave us submarines. Science fiction gave us, um, uh, I mean, for better or for worse, long-range artillery, right, with the Earth to the moon. No, no, you're, you're right. You know. And, you know, I mean, even going to the moon, that, that's all, you know, the people who, who went there first were the science fiction writers. Right, exactly. Um, no, I, I think it, it's a great prophetic literature. And, again, it's something which is not is kind of downplayed or seen as being kind of juvenile or not necessary. But, but it's, sparked, it's all about sparking that inspiration, like Parsons sparked the inspiration to build rockets. Right. So, so does sci-fi spark that. And the most important thing is the spark. I mean, I think that... One thing that I think the show conveys, and well, the show, your book, and additional, because um, more and more productions about Jack Parsons are coming out, um, it was that Thelema gave him a way to channel what was in his head and yeah. bring it out. You know, it wasn't, I mean, of course, you know we, we all we we referred to it as a cult, and you know it was a, but it was like self help before self help was was a thing. <laughs> yeah, no, no, very much so. Um, I think that's exactly right, and it was also, you know, and it had this parallel kind of vision alongside kind of going into space, which was this kind of improvement of oneself, of of leaving one's, you know base humanity and improving upon it. You know, Rocketry said, we're, we're going to leave the world and we're going to go into space. And Delaina, to a certain extent, said, we're going to leave humanity as we know it and progress to a greater level of humanity. Right. Um, exactly. And so I think he saw them both as kind of 
you know, I, I try and say this in my book, he saw them as two sides of the same coin, you know, both, you know, were seen as ridiculous, both were seen as foolish, but both were seen as improving mankind in general. Um, you know, the science of rocketry and the religion of Thelema. Mm. Um, so I, I think for him, they would, they would, you couldn't have one without the other. If you're going to go into outer space, you need to improve yourself as well, right. and vice versa. Well, and then you also have the the... There's a saying, I forget who said it, but basically uh, science was magic before we figured out what it was. Right, no, exactly, yes. I, I think, um, yeah, was that Arthur C. Clarke, uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Exactly, I think that's it. there you, you go. You, you said something like that, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and it's true, it's true. And, and Parsons really was, I feel as though he was like the last of the people who could say that with a straight face. Right. <laughs> you know, he, he was, uh, you know, it's kind of like he was back in the 1930s. Science hadn't quite covered everything completely. And he was in the same way that Isaac Newton, you know, as well as standing all the laws on which physics is based today, was also interested in alchemy. I think Parsons really saw himself as being, oh, I'm interested in rocketry and I'm interested in you know, in Salima, in the occult, in Alistair Crowley's teachings. He, I think he was the last person who could really see those as indistinguishable, you know, see it on the same spectrum. Right. Because I think today, if you tried that, science has got so pervasive and has covered so many different bases uh, and is so distinct from anything else, from, from philosophy, from religion, that, um, that I think it would be more difficult today. Well, we I have... I say he was like... Yeah. yeah, no, that you're you're one hundred percent. I agree with you one hundred percent. The um, you know, you have the notion that science is separate from everything now, and right. really the 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 way I, I've I see it is that science was not meant to disprove the supernatural, it was to explain it more okay. so than than anything else. Whereas now it's used to debunk what people believe and it's like well you don't really need to do that you know to to right. to be to to prove a, a scientific fact you don't have to you know tell these per people that they're stupid for what they believe just because you right. want to prove um i don't even know if you want to say reality because reality is is uh, <laughs> eye of the beholder right a tricky concept right <laughs> um so no, I think I think you're right. There's a sudden kind of idea of, of science being, you know, a, a great kind of explainer rather than a, a kind of hammer to squash ideas. Exactly. Um, and, and to a certain extent, it feels like it's become the latter, whereas I think we want to kind of embrace the former more. Right, and and it it people need wonder in in their lives, and I right. think that's one reason why his story remains intriguing to a lot of people because you know, he took two really, you know, you would never consider, you know, a scientist going home and trying to conjure uh, Elemental that night, <laughs> right? Right. Um, you, you know, that's not something you think about, but when you hear it, you're like, okay, tell me more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. You know. Right. Well, I, I hope that's the case. I mean, you know, I, I hope it's, Still the case. I mean, I think the idea is, you know, go into those unexplained corners and go into try the most crazy things. And yes, they may not work, but what if they do? What if they do? I, exactly. I think that's the story. Exactly. Yeah. What if it? What if it works? What if? What if? What if two guys from Pasadena, California, can show us how to get to the moon? <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, George, I really, really, really appreciate you doing this with me. Um, it's an amazing book, and I, I have it on audiobook actually, and I uh, listen to it on repeat. My, my girlfriend is kind of annoyed with me. <laughs> but uh, I apologize. <laughs> I, I, I tell her, I tell her that uh, I, I tell her it's for a good cause. <laughs> uh and uh i mean the the i love the show i mean i've seen every episode and i write about it and i'm i'm in the strange angel group on facebook and they're they're gonna love this interview so once again i, I really appreciate you doing this with me yeah well I, it's been a great pleasure I, you know i i love talking about a story i my main aim in writing the book 
was to get it more known by people because I think he was criminally unknown um, before, and I think that's slowly happening. And I hope the TV show can, you know, aid that. So hopefully they'll they'll renew it and and run for the, you know, a few more seasons yet. Well, actually, I'm glad you bring that up because you know we just celebrated the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. Um, mm-hmm. and he, there's a crater on the moon with his name, That's but right. it's on the dark side of the moon and except for Pink Floyd, no one really talks about the dark side of the moon. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think yeah, that, so do you think he'll ever get the same recognition as the people who came later who made that possible? I don't know. I mean, when I was first writing about it, uh, Caltech were incredibly uninterested in uh, in any way recognizing him as part of their heritage. Um, they really had swept him kind of under the launch pad of the whole space program. Uh, the very fact that now when you go online, you can type in, type in Jack Parsons, and, you know, there are loads of web pages spring up, um, which there weren't back in 2003, you know. Um, I think that's great. I don't know if he'll ever be completely embraced by the bosom of the establishment just because he is the quintessence of anti-establishmentism. Um, so I don't think they can ever do it, and I don't think he would ever want to be embraced by them. But I think the public knowledge of him hopefully will grow and grow, and, and, and he'll be kind of like the, you know, the kind of flip side of Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. There'll be, you know, Jack Parsons on the dark side of the moon. There you go. <laughs> that's a great way to end I, George thank you so much for doing with doing this with me I, I, once again I really can't thank you enough for taking the time oh, it's a great pleasure Jason take care take care thank you <laughs>